Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this latest PILTS webinar. Uh, today's topic is UKCA marking, and uh, I hope that uh, you're all well and looking forward to uh, listening in and uh, seeing what uh, we can help you and inform you with on, uh, on this topic on our webinar today. So, uh, without uh, further ado, um, my name is Alec Bryce. I'll be hosting the webinar today, and I have two colleagues, Jason and Jamie, who are in the uh, chat room. So any questions that you have during the course of the webinar, if you put them in the, uh, the questions box and the little toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen, then uh, they will be able to hopefully answer them during the course of the, uh, the webinar. If uh, we get uh, a lot of questions or we can't answer it during the webinar, then um, we will come back to you um, after the, the webinar is finished, uh, either later today or, uh, or early next week, to, uh, to hopefully answer your questions and queries. Uh, the slides are available on request. Just drop us a little note in the uh, question section if you would like a copy of the slides, and uh, we'll look to, to get those sent out to you. So, um, today's agenda, uh, as I say, the topic is UKCA marking specifically for machinery. So we will look at what is machinery, who has the responsibilities for UKCA marking, what are the essential health and safety requirements, or the EHSRs, that are applicable via the supply and machinery safety regulations, uh, how we would UKCA mark machinery, uh, the UKCA marking process itself, and then a couple of little useful links and things for you to finish it all off. So, um, just as a, uh, an aside, so UKCA marking, uh, hopefully the majority of you will be aware now, but this is the new UK conformity marking uh, that will replace PE marking that has been used in the UK since 1995 for uh, equipment that is coming on to the GB market. It basically talks about the, uh, the, the, the details of what is required to enable you to fix it. Uh, and the UKCA mark ideally will be affixed directly to the machine or the product or the good, uh, if you will. But until the end of December 25, you are allowed to affix a label with the UKCA mark uh, to the machine or an accompanying document rather than the machinery itself. But after 31st of December 25, it has to be fixed to the machine. In an ideal world, we'll do that now, but um, if that's not quite possible, um, then, uh, then you, as you say, up until end of 2025, you can put it on some supplementary measure. So the, uh, the timelines, it's been applicable since uh, 1st of January 2021. We've had the transitionary period that finishes at 11 p.m. on the 31st of December this year. So basically from 1st of January 2023, the UKCA mark is a requirement for the GB market. Now. Um, up until then, you can still use the CE mark uh, and any goods that are on the market uh, already prior to that, that are CE marked, can continue to circulate on the market until they reach their final destination. So if people have got things in stock and things like that, then, then um, they can still use them until they, uh, they sell them on to uh, the, uh, the, the final end user, if you will. So, and as we've said, until January 25, you can put it on the label, but after that, uh, the 1st of uh, Jan 25, it must be on the, the product itself. So, uh, if we look at a little bit about the, uh, the legislation behind it all, um, it basically uh, boils down to the Supply of Machinery Safety Regs, 2008, they implemented what is the machinery directive which we've all been very familiar with and working with from 
uh, a machinery compliance point of view um, for CE marking, uh, but um, following uh, the uh, uh, the GB sort of uh, leaving Europe, so uh, for, as, as of Brexit, um, the Withdrawal Act basically preserved the UK regulations so that, uh, to enable us to uh, continue to function effectively, but also to allow us to amend them. And um, as of 2019, the Product Safety and Metrology Etc. Amendment uh, regs, uh, or the Mega SI as it's commonly known, allowed us to um, uh, make changes into the, uh, the existing regulations to make it GB specific um, with the UK leaving the, uh, the, the EU. And we will look at some of the, the common changes in things regarding that later on. So um, basically, the supply machinery safety regs and their amendments make it an offence for a responsible person to supply machinery or partly com completed machinery or indeed safety components unless they comply with the regulations. And the easiest way to comply with the regulations is to, uh, in essence, do checks against the EHSRs or the essential health and safety requirements that are in there. Uh, carry out any necessary conformity assessment procedures, conduct a risk assessment, draw up the declaration of conformity, and uh, that will then allow you to affix the, uh, the, the documentation and the UKCA mark uh, onto the machinery that's concerned with it. So, in essence, who needs to UKCA mark something? Uh, well, if you look at, into the regulations, then that will be uh, OEMs, so people who manufacture and make machinery, any system integrators that uh, that put uh, systems together as, uh, as a, a, a non-complete item into a, a full line or something like that, uh, any agent that imports machinery, uh, any company that directly imports machines, so any into company transfer so if you're a global business and you bring something in from one of your divisions outside of the uk then you will need to ukca market when you bring it in uh, anybody who builds machinery for their own use so if you build things in-house then you will still uh, even though you are not supplying it on the general market you're supplying it for use within your own factory uh, and therefore you'll still need to ensure that you comply with the requirements and anybody that substantially modifies a machine beyond its original specification uh, also can be termed as uh, as making a significant change to a machine. So if you uh, change its, its function or purpose or, or anything like that, uh, if you introduce any new hazards and so on, then you will need to look at recertifying something. The enforcement for the uh, UKCA marking in the UK will be done by the HSE, the Health and Safety Executive. And they will be the people that will um, initially enforce uh, a penalty. Uh, the penalty can be um, in the form of, of a fine, but it could also be up to uh, two years of, uh, of prison. And the, uh, the court, uh, uh, will decide what the uh, the prison term will be should any prosecution be taken to court rather than uh, than a fine that's issued. So um, um, the HSC uh, will be the uh, the people that come around looking to ensure in their normal inspections as you go around that things are compliant and, uh, and marked up correctly. But also um, uh, if there are unfortunately are any incidents or anything that they're called to. Uh, they will be looking to ensure that, again, there's compliance uh, with the relevant EHSRs, et cetera, uh, of the specific regulations for, for UKCA marking have been complied with. So we're, we're talking, in essence, primarily about machinery uh, in this specific instance. And um, we're just going to look at the definitions of what actually is a machine. Uh, in essence, the, the basic or the key definition is an assembly fitted with or intended to be fitted with 
a drive system other than directly applied human or animal effort consisting of link parts or components at least one of which moves which are joined together for, for a specific application so you see a couple of examples there so things like a, a mixer system without its uh, its drive and, and things like that on the, that's there it also goes on to define it as uh, an assembly which is as per what we've just said but missing only the components to connect it on site or to sources of energy and motion so things where we might have a machine that needs to have some form of uh, physical power connection things made to it or it's got um, uh, an LEV system for ventilation or something like that or, or whatever might be for uh, ensuring it's safe operation once it's actually installed or if it's indeed mounted on a means of transport so again all, all of the above will apply and the, de the definitions are the same but also that it is ready to be installed and able to function as it stands only if mounted on a means of transport or installed in a building or infrastructure so tail lifts on the back of trailers uh, tail lifts on the side of buildings and things like that for loading and unloading uh, vehicles and so on uh, cranes etc on uh, on high abs and so on still come under definitions of a machine we move on to assemblies of machinery again <clears throat> the, uh, the the core definition is still applicable um, but also to specific partly completed machinery which in order to achieve the same end are controlled so that they function as a whole so this is where you will have uh, machines that um, have to be connected to other machines in order to them to actually uh, uh, can produce their uh, design function uh, and so on. and finally the lifting of loads so uh, this looks at an assembly of linked parts or components at least one of which moves which are joined together intended for lifting loads and whose only power source is directly applied human effort so here we're talking, excuse me, we're talking manual hoist, block and tackle style things. We're not including here um, lifts uh, for moving uh, persons and, and things like that. This is purely um, the, uh, something that is moved under manual effort. So there are definitions of, uh, of a machine and what a machine is. Um, and we're going to move on to look at the... Uh, or an overview of the essential health and safety regulations as defined in the supply of machinery safety regulations and in essence um, this outlines as we've said uh, the core things that you need to comply with for supplying machinery into the market uh, as we know no responsible person shall place it on the market unless it's safe and before they do that, they need to ensure that the EHSRs that we're going to look through are satisfied. There's a technical file. Um, there are the necessary instructions and things on how to operate it. Uh, there has been a relevant conformity assessment procedure uh, looked at and complied with. And there is a declaration of conformity, which is either uh, which companies with the machinery, and the mark is either on the machine itself or uh, as we said, up to the end of 2025 on accompanying documentation uh, or something like that that can go with it. So, uh, Schedule 2 of the annexes within the, uh, the regulations look at the EHSRs and uh, Section 1.2 is specifically regarding control systems and how they start, stop, e-stop, uh, how different mode selections can be made, what happens should you have any power supply or control circuit failures and also some details around um, the, the definitions uh, and functions regarding the, uh, the software if applicable to to a machine in essence uh, they must be designed and constructed that they can withstand operating stresses and external influences so think of um, emc and, and and that type of thing uh, a fault in the hardware or the software doesn't lead to a dangerous situation, so a fail-safe system. 
Errors in the logic do not lead to hazardous situations. So again, it goes into a safe state. And any reasonably foreseeable human error during operation does not lead to a hazardous situation. So we to ensure that we can make sure that anybody that um, is in using the controls to operate the machinery can't do something that would lead to uh, a dangerous situation arising. We need to particularly look at uh, things to ensure that the machinery does not start unexpectedly, that the parameters don't change in an uncontrolled way, and it has to be uh, specific actions and things that uh, that allow um, changes to be made, uh, and also that it must not be prevented from stopping if a stop command has been given. So it must if somebody presses the stop, it must stop before it can be restarted uh, or or any other functions. Uh, done. Um, no moving part or piece held by the machinery must fall or be ejected. So um, if we think on um, grippers on a robot arm or something like that that might be holding something, um, should uh, the thing come to a, a, a stop or an e-stop or we lose uh, power to the control system or something like that, then we need to ensure that that isn't um, simply dropped uh, and um, uh, or thrown or ejected or anything out of a, a machine where it's being held in place. Uh, any automatic or manual stopping of moving parts must be unimpeded. So if it's coming to a standstill, it must continue to come to a standstill. All protective devices remain fully effective or are given the stop command. And the safety parts of the control system apply in a coherent way to the whole of an assembly and or the partly completed assembly. So global e-stop systems will affect everything within the, the, uh, the, the span of works of control or span of control, should I say, for the, uh, the requirements for, for e-stops, for example. 1.2.2 looks at control devices and states that each control position, uh, the operator must be able to ensure that nobody is, is in a danger zone or that they are designed and constructed so that starting is prevented while somebody's in that danger zone. So we have some sort of presence detection or something like that. Uh, if neither is uh, possible, then we must have some sort of audio visual pre-start alarm or something like that so that people can be aware that machinery is going to uh, going to start or to move. Um, and where we may have more than one control position, it must be designed in such a way that the use of one of them precludes the use of the others, except for stops and e-stops. So ideally, where you have multiple control stations, there will be one master station where you would perform the, uh, the, the start and the restart functions and things like that from. 1.3 looks at protection against mechanical hazards and ensures that the machinery must be stable, so securely um, fixed to the, the floor or the wall or a bench or whatever it may be, that there is no risk of breakup during operation. Um, we have the relevant protection against falling or ejected objects. There's no risks due to uh, surfaces with any sharp edges or angles or anything like that or anything related to com combined machinery. We also need to look at where there may be variations in operating conditions. So it might be that certain parts of the process, the machine will go into high speed to do a certain uh, something or other uh, as part of the, the actual process of what it's doing or what it's manufacturing or something. Uh, and then any risk of uncontrolled movement where a key thing where if we have a situation where we are detecting standstill of a machine, we need to ensure that you continually monitor it to ensure that we don't get any drift or any movement from that standstill position and that it does not cause any, uh, any hazard. We need to, to make sure that we can, we can do that. Um, this also leads into uh, to, to guarding itself and, and machine guarding and protection against uh, any risks and things from from moving parts where again standstill is a uh, a key issue to ensure that um, should somebody open a guard for example things that we've made sure that any moving parts and things are at a standstill before uh, we can allow anybody into a guard 
Um, but guards themselves can be classed uh, as different types of uh, protective devices and that they must be robust and secure, not give rise to additional hazards, not be easily bypassed and located at a suitable distance away from the hazard point. They may be of various different types, for example, fixed interlocking movable guards, adjustable guards, and, and so on. Um, in relation to fixed guards, then they must only be opened with a specific tool. Uh, the fixings must remain attached to the guard or the machinery once it's been removed. Um, so in essence, you can't sort of um, lose a, a, a guard fixing or, or anything like that because it is permanently attached. Uh, and where possible, guards must fall away. They can't be um, hung over an area uh, on, a, on a top rail or something like that and just hang in front of the, uh, the, the hazardous uh, moving parts, for example, um, without the fixings being in place. With relation to interlocking movable guards, they must, as far as possible, remain attached to the machine when open. So a hinged guard of some type uh, and designed to be only adjusted by means of intentional action. So you, they're not easily overridden or bypassed in essence. Uh, and interlocked, interlocking movable guards associated with an interlocking device must ensure, as we said earlier, that hazardous moving parts uh, are uh, brought to a standstill and the guard remains closed until it's got to a standstill or um, we can issue a stop command should that interlock be opened and that stop commands remain constant until that guard is again closed to prevent access to the moving parts. Again, uh, 41, uh, 1.4.22 looks at, uh, as we said there, with keeping the guards closed until the moving um, uh, rotating parts for example things have come to standstill so this is where you would look at having something like a uh, request to enter button so you could uh, request entry to or request to open the guard the control system brings the machine to a standstill we monitor it to make sure it's at standstill then we can unlock the guard and allow access in through the guard door itself. There are other sections uh, and other hazards and things in section 1.5 which will include uh, issues and topics related to supply voltage, fire, vibration, uh, emissions of, of hazardous, hazardous materials so um, any um, sort of airborne um, gases and things like that that might come off um, anybody potentially being trapped inside a machine if you've got full body access or something like that, any risks of slip, trip, falls, um, lightning protection, etc. etc. Section 1.6 looks at maintenance and defines uh, the things that have to be considered when designing the machine to ensure that you have ease of access to the operating position and the servicing points that you can isolate the energy sources that's all energy sources uh, electrical pneumatic uh, hydraulic um, gravity uh, is something also that uh, needs to be taken into uh, into account uh, uh, any operator intervention and to allow safe cleaning etc of uh, internal parts um, we also must ensure that uh, where we have the um, means to isolate that uh, we can ensure that the isolator that we're using is the right one so it's clearly labeled as to its function uh, we can lock it off so nobody can come along and switch it on while still working on it um, and also we need to ensure that um, should energy be cut off we can also dissipate any stored energy or anything like that that might still be uh, applicable that's actually in the machine downstream of the isolation device itself <clears throat> section 1.7 looks at information and um, the things that you have to look at as well as uh, warning signs warning devices 
it labels for uh, instructional use, warnings about PPE and so on and things like that. Um, we're talking specifically about UKCA marking. So in this case, it must be in English, um, but it also may have uh, uh, accompanying documentation uh, in any of the languages uh, that is able to be understood by the operators. So if you're um, non-native speaking, uh, you must also be able to uh, understand what's happening in there, and and, and that's a responsibility from uh, from those that that uh, that would govern the uh, the use of uh, of operators and things coming in. It must be marked visibly, legibly, and indelibly. Uh, and specifically, when we're talking about the um, uh, the UKCA marking section itself, it, the machine will include the details of the business name and address of the manufacturer or the OEM, where applicable, any authorised representative, um, the designation of the machinery, so what it is, the UKCA mark itself and the symbol, which we saw at the beginning, uh, it can be um, used. Uh, it doesn't have to be black and white, as we saw, as uh, we saw there at the beginning. Uh, it can be in any colour. It must be no smaller than five mil on the machine, and also it can't be in any other font. It has to remain in that font and that uh, that format as when you scale or down the the size of the mark. The machine must also have uh, the designation of its series or type, a serial number if applicable, and the year that it was actually constructed uh, or the manufacturing process was completed if it's an assembly of machines, for example. There are some further additional groups that will need to be taken into consideration. I'm not going to go into these specifically today, but group two will include Machinery specific for food stuff, cosmetics, pharmaceutical, woodworking, handheld or pesticides machinery. Group three looks at specific hazards with mobile machinery. Group four is lifting operations. Uh, so that's uh, lifting and moving of goods, etc. Scissor lifts and that type of thing. Group five is machinery for underground and mining works, etc. Uh, and group six is uh, machinery specific for uh, lifting people, so personnel lifts uh, and, uh, uh, that you'll find in, um, uh, in, in sort of factories, buildings, uh, etc. So hopefully that's given you a, a flavour of the sort of things that need to be um, addressed uh, and ensured that we have compliance with with regards to the EHSRs from the supplier machinery regulations. And now specifically we're, we're going to look at a, a few details on uh, how to actually UK CA mark uh, a particular machine. Um, and there are different things that we can do, one of which being self-declaration. So if in the past you have been uh, CE marking your own machinery, then you can continue to do that with the UKCA marking. There is absolutely um, no change in the, uh, the, the compliance, uh, conformity assessment procedures, etc. that you will look at. Um, what you will need to do is to check the specific UK regulations that are the equivalents of the EU directives that you've been using for CE marking. So check that the, uh, the regulations and the EHSRs within those regulations are complied with before affixing the UKCA mark to the machine for the GB market. You can affix the UKCA mark and the CE mark to the same machine only as long as the, uh, the EU requirements and the GB requirements are the same. At the moment, there is no change in the requirements that you have for either route to compliance. And until they change, then you can have both on a particular machine. One thing just to bear in mind, that if you are selling to the uh, European Union or the Euro market, uh, or Northern Ireland, then CE marking still remains mandatory. UK CA marking is not recognised 
outside of the GB market. So if you were CE marking a machine for, for the EU, you will continue to CE market to go into the EU. And we'll talk about who can sign declarations and conformity and things like that uh, in a little while. Um, but, um, but as we said, for self-declaration, for previously for CE marking, you can continue to do so for UK CA marking. It may be that you in the past have used a notified body. As of Brexit, as of the 1st of January 2021, a UK notified body automatically became a UK approved body. And for UK CA marking, you will need to use a UK approved body. And because a, a, a EU notified body cannot be used because they are not resident in the, in the, in the UK. So you will need for um, a Schedule 4 on a, an Annex 4 type machine where you need uh, uh, approval by uh, uh, an authorised body or a recognised body, then you will need to ensure for UK CA marking you use a UK approved um, body for the requirements. Due to um, what was a massive backlog um, the, uh, and issues and delays and things with regards to um, the COVID situations and so on, um, in June of this year, the government announced that they will be introducing legislation to allow um, any completed machinery assessments that have been done by um, EU um, bodies to be used as proof of conformity for UKCA um, requirements um, as long as it was done before the 1st of January 2023. So if that had been done by a non-UK conformity assessment body um, before that date, then you can take that as proof of compliance for UKCA marking as well. You will need to ensure that you put the UKCA mark on the machine and you will use a, um, uh, a UKCA declaration of conformity, in essence. If it's for ongoing production, so series production and things like that, then you will in time need to use a UK approved body once the relevant certification has expired or after the five year time limit of 31st of December 2027, whichever appear, uh, arises first. So yeah, the, the, the long and short of it basically is that you will need to eventually go through that, but because of existing backlogs and issues and things like that, for the time being, you can use um, conformance that's been done by a non-UK uh, assessment body as long as it's been done as we said before 1st of Jan 23. So uh, as we've said um, you need to on the uh, UK declaration of conformity list the relevant UK designated standards and their equivalent uh, of the UK harmonised standards that were used by the uh, EU body. Um, but um, anything that's not been completed before the 1st of January 2023 is considered a new product. So you will then need to start afresh and use a UK approved body. Um, that also includes where goods are subject to changes. So any overall original performance, uh, performance, purpose or type will again need new certification. Um, and um, as we've said, that needs to be compliant with the GB regulation or requirements, um, including the UK approved body from the 1st of January 2023. You also have the opportunities, if required, to use an authorised representative. So uh, an OEM, a manufacturer, a system integrator um, can choose to um, appoint an authorised representative to perform all or part of the obligations that they need to comply with uh, and act as their 
responsible person. Now, mandated uh, authorised reps, and it must be in the form of a, of a written mandate, uh, mandated authorised reps for the GB market can be based in Britain or Northern Ireland, but not based outside of the UK. Okay, so you can uh, you can only mandate an authorised rep who's established under uh, established in the UK under the 2008 regs as they apply in Great Britain. You see on the little map there the differences between Great Britain and the UK. Great Britain being mainland, UK being including Northern Ireland. <clears throat> Probably, I, I'm guessing there will have been a few questions about the signing uh, of a declaration of conformity for self-declaration. The regulations were changed with the, the mega SI. Well, we'll talk about this a little bit more later. But in essence, uh, in the fact that if you choose to mandate an authorised representative, they have to be based in the UK. If you choose to use an approved body, they have to be based in the UK. So whilst the mega SI dictates the changes that says omit the um, part of the signature on the Declaration of Conformity must be based um, in the EU, um, then, uh, but it doesn't say replace with UK. But it logically, in my opinion, it logically sings true that if you have to use a authorised rep that has to be based in the UK, if you have to use an approved body that has to be based in the UK, then for me, logic dictates that if you are self-certifying, you have to be based in the UK. Just on the note, and now you see at the bottom there, anybody that is uh, an authorised rep, um, same as for a uh, approved body. Uh, if you are looking to um, export into the uh, EU market or the Northern Ireland market, then you will need to be based um, outside of uh, of the UK. So you can be based in, in Northern Ireland or, or in Europe for the CE requirements and things that you would have for that because um, no authorised rep or, or approved body uh, is recognised under uh, EU law for that purpose. So hopefully that's cleared that up a little bit. Um, so if we look at the legislation itself uh, and, and the things that um, that's led us to, to get to this point, um, statutory instruments or the, um, the the UK regulations are the things that we need to ensure that we are proving compliance to. Um, so, for example, we mentioned earlier also that the machinery directive that um, we've known for quite some time now and what we've been using for CE compliance is, in essence, transposed uh, into the UK under the 2008 Supplier Machinery Safety Regs and then um, amended in, by the, uh, the, the 2019 uh, Mega SI which we'll have reference for as well. But uh, as a result of, uh, of Brexit, uh, there are a number of uh, regulations that you certainly will need to use as a reference, as proof of compliance for machinery. Uh, those that you can see highlighted in red are basically the, um, the sort of key ones that you would look at to um, prove your compliance so um, things like electrical equipment safety regs uh, electromagnetic compatibility regs um, lifting operations lifting equipment regs etc and you see there um, references uh, part t the supplier machinery safety regs 2008 there are many of them um, that you will need to look at what you need to do is ensure that you address the requirements of all that are applicable to your uh, actual machine. Some typical ones um, that we would use that you may be familiar with previously. So, for example, the machinery directive is now the supply machinery safety regs, the EMC directive, electromagnetic compatibility regs, and so on. Um, general product safety directive is the general product safety regulations. 
all of these are amended um, by the, the mega SI as well. But you can see on there what was the EU directive is the uh, also the equivalent UK statutory instrument. As I've said, uh, there was, uh, following Brexit, uh, the introduction of the Product Safety and Metrology, et cetera, Amendment, et cetera, EU exit regs, mega mouthful, but everybody basically refers to it as the, the, the mega SI. And that will outline specific changes in things um, as to what was in the supply machinery safety regs, because they were directly related to um, the machinery directive. So I had a lot of, uh, of EU references and things like that in there, which are no longer applicable post Brexit. So in essence, uh, this came in under section two, part two of the European Communities Act 1972, accordingly saved by virtue of the European Withdrawal Act, which basically allowed us to apply uh, or make an application of the UK CA mark in place of the CE mark to ensure there was no reduction in safety of products, the accuracy of protection of consumers, uh, maintain the requirements for product safety by retaining the appropriate um, European obligations that we had as far as the UK logos. And then, as we've said also, to affix uh, any EU references that are no longer applicable. So what does that actually mean? Well, some of the sort of key phrases and things that have changed from what you may find if you've got an older copy of the uh, 2008 uh, Supply Machinery Safety Regs. Um, the directive is now referred to as these regulations. The notified body is referred to now in the UK as an authorised body, as we mentioned earlier. Farming I standards are designated standards. The EEA state is referred to in the UK now as the United Kingdom, and CE marking is now referred to as UK CA marking. But the essential health and safety regulations that are in the machinery directive are still enshrined in the UK supply of machinery safety regulations. At this time, there are no changes between the two. It may in the future change, but at the moment, there is no change. The standards and things that can be used as proof of compliance are identical between CE marking and the UK CA marking objectives that you have to comply with. So, as far as a designated standard, as it's now called, this is uh, a technical specification adopted by a recognised standardised body. Um, it's designated by the Secretary of State as a published reference, um, and it basically can come from uh, any recognised standardisation body. So it might be uh, CN, it might be CENLEC, it might be ETSI, or it might indeed be the British Standards Institute or the BSI themselves. A designated standard, therefore, can be prefixed with BS, EN, ENISO, or ENIC. The EN prefix indicates that it has um, been adopted as a European standard. Um, and anything that you have used as proof of compliance and referred to as an EN standard is absolutely fine to continue to use as your uh, proof of compliance and uh, a recommended technical specification that you've looked at um, for UK CA marking. There was uh, a list of designated standard uh, that were um, issued by the Department for Business en Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, and that was uh, published on the 1st of January 2021. Um, and the list, although it was published by the UK government, um, is just a list of EN standards. There is no BSEN, so there's no BS prefix in front of it. So that, that list itself is just uh, an EN prefix on the front of the specific standards. So uh, what you have used in the past, you can continue to use moving forward at this time as there are no changes between the two. So if we look at the actual UKCA marking process, how do you get to that end result? 
it's a fairly straightforward process. If you've been doing it in the past, you'll be aware of the typical sort of things that you need to look at. Um, it is, in essence, uh, a fairly simple six-step process that can be um, can be looked at to, to work through. Each step will have a number of, a number of different things that you need to do to carry out to complete it. They can be completed in any order, with the exception of the final step. You need to ensure that you have all steps one to five completed before you can actually affix the UKCA mark to the machine itself. So, um, what you need to do, if we look through briefly, pretty quickly going through each step, the legal framework, we need to look at um, what um, regulations uh, the uh, machine is covered by. So typically for machinery, we will have supply machinery safety regs, we'll have the electric equipment safety regs, we'll have the electromagnetic compatibility regs. There could be many, many more. You saw the long list on an earlier slide and you need to ensure that you are aware of all of the applicable regulations that apply to your specific machine. You need to define the requirements, which can be through a, a, a number of, of different routes. So we can look at the essential requirements for each applicable regulation. Um, as we said, you need to look and see that uh, is uh, the definitions of a machine uh, inclusive in a specific regulation for your applications. We need to conduct a risk assessment in order to identify the applicable EHSRs. And we can use designated standards, non-designated standards. We can use technical specifications. So, for example, collaborative robots and things. If you're using method four, it might be, for example, TS15066, which is not ratified as a standard yet, but it's a technical specification, but can be used as references uh, for a, uh, um, a conformance um, to a specific requirement. We will look at the specific conformity assessment procedure that needs to be followed. And again, these will be laid out in the regulations, but there are various procedures that we can look at depending on the type of product. It might be something that you can uh, find within there. It might be that some of the regulations only uh, offer certain procedures. Some may offer all the various different types of procedures that you can go through. Some, as we said, a Schedule 4 or an Annex 4 type machine things will require the involvement of an approved body. So um, there may be things like uh, production control, internal checks, type examination, quality assurance to make sure that um, any um, materials supplied for construction of the body of the machine are the same and we're using the same thickness of steel or whatever it might be and things like that. Um, it might be that uh, you, you know that you need to use various different ones to look at it. As we said, it may be that you need to look at Annex 4. Is there a specific C-type standard for the machine? So for example, there's a, a standard, a C-type standard for conveyors. There's one for uh, ladders and access platforms. There's one for palletizers. There's all different types of mach machinery. There, there may be a C-type standard that you can follow that will dictate the assessment procedures and things that you need to, uh, to look at as proof of compliance. Does that C-type standard cover all aspects of the machine? It might be a brand new innovative, innovative type of machine that's new on the market that you're building and developing. So does it cover all aspects of it? Are there extra things that you need to be aware of that aren't covered by the CTAP specific standard and so on? We also, a very, very important part of it, also need to look at validation. So we will uh, look at making sure that the essential requirements are identified and, uh, and we comply with them. We have a risk assessment completed. 
we note all the standards and things that we've used as proof. Some parts of this may also require um, uh, physical tests, so uh, or practical tests and things like that, or calculations. So, for example, if we are doing validation of the safe parts of the control system, so we would look at um, EN 13849 Part 2. So you would have the calculations to prove that your design and product selection, expected uses, et cetera, meets the requirements of the specific performance level from your risk assessment. It might be um, practical tests so that we can prove that the um, safety related control system functions as it should. So we might put a short on an e-stop, take a wire off a guard switch or something like that to ensure that it goes into a safe state or picks up that fault or whatever it might be. So this validation can, can come in in many different forms, uh, most of which can be done alongside the construction process. So we can do it, um, certainly the calculations for control systems and things can be done during the initial design phases and so on. So you don't have to wait until the very end to be able to do it all. All of which, though, will then go into uh, and be stored in the technical file. So the manufacturer or their authorised rep is obligated to prepare the technical file. Uh, that technical file will hold a number of various things within it uh, that will be used as proof. It must be stored for at least 10 years. Uh, and that will be if you have series produced machines, it's after the last one of the series has been manufactured. Um, it must be handed over to, for example, in the UK, the, the HSE uh, on request. Uh, it doesn't have to be stored in its entirety. Uh, it doesn't have to be stored in the UK. It can be stored uh, in various different bits, in the cloud, for example, or something like that. But you must be able to compile it uh, in a, uh, a short period of time to be able to um, submit it to the, to the HSE, for example. For UKCA marking, it must be in English, and it will contain things like copies of the risk assessments, mechanical electrical drawings, if applicable, pneumatic hydraulics, the control circuit drawings, the calculations, test results, as we've said, for example, the uh, 13849 part two validation uh, calcs, conformity of the uh, machine with the essential requirements, so the EHSR checklists, a list of the regulation standards, technical specs and things that are used as proof of compliance. Description of methods to eliminate hazards. A copy of the instructions. And a copy of the declaration of conformity. There may be various other things that are specific. Uh, I know that when we do, uh, do it at Pilts, uh, we have 24, 26 different um uh chapter sections for a, uh, a technical file all of which or some of which will be applicable uh, but there are uh the requirements as you see there is a minimum of what must be held within that technical file once we've got all that we've put it all together then we can actually affix the ce mark okay so once we've got all that lot there uh, together as the thing, we can draw up and sign the UK Declaration of Conformity, um, where that is the, uh, the document that states who is taking responsibility to say that the product, the machine, the goods fully complies with all the relevant applicable regulations. Um, and on order basically justifies the, the compliance with the list of the designated standards and things as we've said, or we have lists of the other technical references and things that we've, or type testing or whatever it might be that we've used to approve conformity. We only need to draw one declaration of conformity. So if there are numerous regulations and things, we will list all the ones applicable, but there will only be one declaration of conformity as we said uh, that declaration of conformity must be kept as part of the technical file uh, and saved for 10 years it must also be delivered with the machine tends to be 
Um, the front part of uh, instruction manuals and things like this, there'll be some technical data about the machine and the declaration conformity. Um, I found when looking at machinery has uh, more often than not been included at the front part of, of that documentation. Um, it usually will be for a single product, but also if there's a product portfolio or a type of product, then it, it can be included for that. And you cannot pre or post date. It must be done as per it is for that particular machine. So um, that documentation, as we've said in pre previously, um, we put the technical file together. Who keeps it? Um, it can be the manufacturer, if they are in the UK, their authorised rep, who must be based in the UK, as we said earlier. Um, if neither of those, it could be the importer or the first one bringing the goods from outside into the UK. Now, that importer, as we said earlier, could be, um, as part of an intercompany transfer, it could be somebody in the UK division that's bringing a, a machine in from uh, one of the uh, divisions of the, the same company outside of, uh, of the UK. So it could be coming from Europe, it could be coming from America or China or, or wherever. So they will need to ensure that they have that relevant documentation that, that they have there. Uh, distributors uh, must also uh, be careful that um, they supply equipment for where the manufacturers have, uh, have done their due diligence, etc. And the equipment bears the CE mark, uh, sorry, UKCA mark, beg your pardon. Um, it's accompanied by the required documents. It's got the right labeling and things on there. So it's on the, the actual um, uh, product itself, or it's on the accompanying documentation or a label that's attached to it that also identifies the importer, if it wasn't the, uh, from the OEM themselves, and that all the instructions, safety information, et cetera, is in English. So that um, basically um, brings us through to uh, the end of uh, what I wanted to, to present to you today. Um, but I have some uh, useful references for you. And, uh, and the key thing uh, I'd like to say is um, uh, don't panic. Continue what you've been doing. Uh, if you've been self-certifying, that's fine. You can continue to do that. If you need external assistance, um, then what I will say is um, contact us, have a chat with us. Let's see how we can maybe help you um, if either by guidance or by uh, the services and things that we can offer uh, to, to get you through that. Uh, Pilts has uh, the uh, service of being able to UKCA mark machinery. We also can act as the authorised representative. Um, even if you have a requirements uh, because uh, of uh, having no presence in uh, in Europe and you need CE marking assistance, again, we can do that. We can use our colleagues who are still in the EU to sign as the authorised representative for UK for CE marking. Um, also, if you're exporting to the Americas, Canada, Brazil, or something like that, for the relevant international compliance, we can help you out with that. So it's not just the the UKCA marking where we can work with you and, and partner with you to, to go through that. Um, if you're bringing machinery into the UK, you want to ensure that it's compliant before it leaves um, a, a foreign OEM or, uh, or one of your divisions outside of the UK or anything like that. We are a global business with locations around the world. So we can send in uh, our colleagues from other countries uh, as far as local support, which also is a benefit in that they speak the local language as well, if it's not English. Um, and we also have services that include sort of a lot of modern and emerging technologies, for example, AGVs, we are seeing more and more commonplace now in industry, um, robotics and specifically collaborative robotics and things like that are services that we can certainly help you out with. So please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Um, discussions cost nothing so please you know uh contact us ask the questions like you know we can certainly uh, discuss what requirements and things you might have and how we may be able to to help you there are also a couple of things on the pilts website we have a um 
uh, a virtual machine that you can look at for solutions and things to aid with um, machine safeguarding uh, and monitoring and things like that that you have within that. Um, if you go on the website, if you, the top picture on the left hand side, if you see that on the, uh, the landing page of the PILTS website, click on the top right hand box that says component systems and solutions and it will load up that virtual machine that you see in the bottom window what will then take you into sections where you can look at applications, find solutions and things like that within there. And uh, I hope you'll already be aware, but we have a, um, a dedicated webinar channel that you can go to and look at previous recordings and things. So things on 13855, Pure, Cobots, um, Safe Operating Modes, which is the, the last one that we did and so on, can all be found on there, which all free to view. You simply register with a, a username and password to uh, allow access to that. Also, specifically for UKCA, there is uh, a reasonable amount of guidance on the government website, and there are some links there that you can look at, including the bottom two, so it's the, the guide to the supplier machinery safety regs, um, and the bottom one, which is a link to the mega SI, so that's the bit that lists the changes uh, within the supply of machinery safety regulations uh, and a, a good number of others within their following uh, following Brexit. Well, that basically um, brings me to an end for today's webinar. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time and for listening to us. Uh, if you've asked any questions, hopefully we've been able to answer those as the session's been ongoing. If not, we will uh, come back to you either later today or the early part of next week uh, with an answer and all that remains for me really is to say I hope you have a great weekend and if you do need any help uh, please don't hesitate in contacting us. Thanks once again and I look forward to hopefully seeing you all again on the next PILTS webinar. Thank you.